Hello, everybody, and welcome to UNIV 391, our course on COVID and the Mason Impact. We are excited to virtually see you out there. The, the, inf the, the interest in this course has been overwhelming, and we are thrilled um, that you are here and interested in this and interested in being excited as a part of the Mason community. Um, I'm Bethany Usher. I'm Associate Provost for Undergraduate Education, and I'm also a biological anthropologist with an interest in the long history of emerging infectious diseases worldwide. Um, and so it was really an, a, an excellent opportunity when I thought, how could we build off this um, off this crisis that we've got to really think about an educational opportunity um, for our students in a way to connect faculty who are really at the front lines of thinking about the impact of the, the pandemic on the global, um, on the globe and on the local communities and personally for each person. Um, and so we wanted to be able to offer this opportunity to you free um, so that you got a sense of what it was like, what we were doing. Um, Mason is a, is a research one nationally, internationally known um, institution doing research um, that is directly related to the pandemic and, and connected to it, to solutions, to analysis, and we wanted to bring that to you. The other really great thing about being at Mason is we're also an undergraduate focused institution. We are nationally known for our opportunities for students to be involved in, in the research that we do and in the community service that we do. Um, and we are also really entrepreneurial. There are opportunities for students to be able to take what they're learning here and build out from there. So we wanted to showcase that as a part of this class. And so not only are we doing it with the speakers that we've got in the class and our opportunities to work with you, we're also doing it with the class itself. So it is offered for free to, to all the students at Mason and we've actually reached 500 students, which is our total limit for the for the class. We're also posting each of the each of the presentations um, the evening after they go after they're live for everyone who's involved in the class on um, on our YouTube channel and through the provost page so that the public can see what we're doing also. So our goal is to both be scholarly and community engaged. Um, and the COVID-19 crisis is really one of those moments where things come together biologically, socially, legally, through the business area, we want to be able to see that round um, impact and not just on a, not a single kind of aspect of it. So, so that was the, the, the impetus for being able to do this. And we hope that as you listen to all the speakers that we've got, as you do the readings and think through the prompts, you're going to get a chance to be able to see that global to personal perspective. And you're going to be spurred on to think about how can you make a difference? What is your impact going to be? And how are you going to be connected to the work that we're doing? Um, and each of the speakers will talk about ways that students are involved for making an impact. So, um, important things for you to be able to know. We've gotten a lot of conversation, a lot of questions from you, and so I wanted to cover a lot of those things so you know what it is to expect with the class um, and how to, how to be a really successful student. Um, as you can see, these courses, the, the whole course is laid out on a series of presentations that are happening at five o'clock on Mondays, Tuesdays, and Thursdays. Um, these presentations will be live. Um, every day, you'll go into the Blackboard site, and the Blackboard site is arranged by week, and then by week, under each week, they'll be arranged by speakers. Let me share my screen for a second, and I will show you what this looks like. So you can see on the screen here, I'll move it so I can see it, the introduction, the, the, the intro course to the page. There's the start here page. Hopefully everybody has gotten to this now. The syllabus, contact your instructor. I'll point out that under contact your instructor, you'll be able to see who's involved in the class. There's a single email. Since this is such a large class, there's a single email. We don't want you to contact us directly. You won't get responses quickly enough. We want you to use the impact gm at gmu.edu to be able to contact us. Um, the other important, a couple of things that are important, you need to use your George Mason University email to contact us. Otherwise, we don't know who you are and we can't share content with you. Um, you also need to sign your names when you're sending things to us. We need to make sure we know who you are when you're writing to us. Um, and we also want you to make sure that you're using this site as a resource. We are building an, an FAQ page that'll be available to you. We're trying to respond to any questions. 
but there are 500 students taking the class. So if you've got a question, it may take 24 hours to be able to answer the question. It's probably much faster to make sure you've checked the syllabus and our emails before you email and ask us a question. So um, you'll also see that we'll send announcements. Every announcement that we send will also be sent as an email to you, but you can always check the archive of announcements here. And we'll do that whenever we need to make an announcement. We won't do it before each class, but we will whenever we need to do updates for you. You'll see that the courses are arranged, that the weeks are arranged here to the side, and each week has the speakers for the week. Um, and when you click on the name of the speaker, so we're going to see Dr. OS today. So you'll see that they're always arranged like this. There's a, bio, a, a faculty bio, tells you about the faculty member, um, the preparatory re readings and resources to do with links to those. They're then followed by the link to this session. And so the link will always be there for you to be able to log in at five o'clock every, every Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday. And finally, it'll be followed by the, the assignment you'll need to do for the class. So our expectation is that what you'll do each, each, for each class session is you'll go and you'll read this straight through. So you'll get to know who the speaker is going to be. You'll look at the preparatory materials. And actually, before you even start going through the preparatory materials, my suggestion is you read through the assignment, the prompt that you need to do. So you've got a context for being able to look at the, at the preparatory materials and being able to listen to the speaker. When you're listening to the speaker and when you're doing the preparatory materials, you should go ahead and make a list of questions you'd like to ask and then edit those as you go along and then you'll be able to use the Q&A feature in Zoom to be able to ask the questions. Um, and we'll, we'll be moderating that at the end of the, at the, end of the session. So you'll read the prompt after you've read the materials and seen the presentation. You'll click on this title up here at the top. That's actually the link to the folder with the, with the discussion board. And you'll go in and it'll lead you here where you can create a thread. And so you'll create a thread. Our expectation is that you'll do the, the, your response here um, within 24 hours of seeing the speakers. We're going to start grading on Friday afternoon. So the drop dead deadline is the Friday of the week where you're doing the presentations. Um, and but because these are going to come so quickly, it makes a lot of sense for you to do them as soon as you're done with the talk. Um, a couple of things about the assignments for this. I'm going to go back here. Um, my suggestion is, is that you need to think about this course as it's not formal. You're not writing a research paper. Um, but you're also not, so I, so I always think of that as writing in a, in, a, in a ball gown or a tux, right? You're not writing in a ball gown or a tux, but you're also not writing in your jammies, right? So this is not something where you just want to fill the box out and be done with it. You want to use Word, use Google, you know, Google Doc, use something so that you sketch out your idea and your answer. You read it and edit it because one of our expectations is this is college level writing and college level thought. So you need to make sure that you are writing it out, that you've edited it, that you've looked at the prompt again after you've written it, made sure you're, if there are multiple parts, parts to the question, you've answered all the parts of the question, and that it's a thoughtful, we, we really want thoughtful, creative, we want, we want at all times as a baseline respectful um, answers to the prompts. So you'll want to take close to an hour to be able to write your response and, and engage with the material, both the presentation and the background material, um, as you write your response. Um, in this, I'd also want to give a tip, uh, an idea about, about academic integrity and our honor code. We want to make sure that this is your work, right? This is academic work, and this is your thought process as you learn about this material. So you're going to be able to see everyone else's discussion post. My suggestion is that you don't go in and read the other discussion posts until you've actually composed your own response. And then you can get engaged in a conversation. You want to make sure that the work you do is your own and no one else's. We're providing you with a lot of background material. And so you, when, you are, when you are referencing things that are not your own, you should be careful to be able to reference that material. So if you are listening to Dr. OS talk and you, and you want to reference that in your talk, you would say, as Dr. OS said today, you can use that. So it's not 
formal in that you have to have a long bibliography, but you do want to acknowledge other people's work. And you'll also, if you are acknowledging the, the preparatory materials that you're doing, you would want to, in fact, say where that material comes from when you're referencing it. We don't expect that you need to go outside to be able to get additional material, but if you do, right, and that, that would be great. You saw a thing in the Washington Post this morning that you wanted to be able to reference, then we would want you to be able to, get a, to do a full reference on it. So as so-and-so said in the Washington Post this morning, we want you to make sure that, that it's clear where you're getting that idea from. Um, it is, it, the most important part of that is you're intellectually honest with yourself. You're making sure that you are, um, showing your ideas and letting us see what you're thinking about this. So, and, and we're really excited about being able to read them and grade them because we want to see the ideas that you've got. So, um, I'm going to stop sharing here um, and come back to me. Um, so, a, a word about grading. The entire class is being graded on a satisfactory no credit, which is the equivalent um, of a pass fail grade. And all of the assignments will be graded with a satisfactory, not satisfactory grade. Um, but what that means is you have to meet our expectations of being well written and well thought out to be able to get a satisfactory on each of the posts. You need to be able to get two, two posts per week with a satisfactory grade each week for the first four weeks and then one of the two at the, on the last week to be able to get a passing grade in the class. So you, we encourage you to do all three, but if you do, you need to get two satisfactory grades per week through the week to be able to do this. Because we're giving you that option, there are really not makeup um, events. We did, and we're not gonna be accepting late work. Um, and it's a really large class, it's hard to keep track of that. If you have a specific emergency situation that will interrupt more than one per week, then you will contact us through that email and you need to have proof of what's going on there and we will help you find some alternative. But other than that, I mean, you should plan on flat tires and you should plan on having, you know, um, your cat interrupt you as you're in the middle of your, of your um, writing. You should be prepared to know that's the reason you've got one the, that it doesn't have to be done or doesn't have to be passing each time. If in fact you do an excellent job on multiple per week, we'll actually get a badge um, in Blackboard for your extra performance. Um, and so, and we do, this is such an amazing collection of scholars who are really engaging and interesting. I have a hard time imagining how you wouldn't want to tune in every day and be engaged in the conversation. Um, the other thing is you're also going to be able to comment on each other's on each other's discussion posts and I've actually seen some of you already starting to do that and that's fabulous. We're not grading those, but y'all are often in places where you're not connected with each other anyway. It's a really nice way to stay connected. Just remember to be respectful in those comments to one another and scholarly, right? You're again not in your pajamas, you're not texting anybody you are in fact having a scholarly conversation. So you need to make sure that you're keeping it at that level um, in the conversations that you're having. But I've actually been impressed by how you're helping each other already in the discussion boards. The last thing I'll say about that is that it's important that you, um, that you are able to use both the information from the, from the background material and the presenter. So if you already, and some of y'all, I'm just, I, I love the fact you were so eager, you already went in and started doing things. If you did and you haven't yet heard the presenter, then you will, um, then you can go back in and edit your post before Friday, um, before the grading begins. So um, the other thing is, this is a public, these are public presentations. So once they're done here in the class, they're gonna be posted on YouTube. The other reason we're doing these at five o'clock is so you can invite family and friends and roommates Maybe they're not all that excited about it, but if they are, I, I'm thrilled for you to be able to bring other people in to be able to watch. Um, and they're gonna be posted on YouTube in the evenings so that you can share them with other people if you are, if there are topics that you think that would be really interesting for them. Um, so I think that's all the baseline information that I, um, I see. I do see that a student asked, do we need citations or can we just show links? Um, if you, your in-text citation should tell us where it is you're getting it. And a link would be good, but you can't just do a link. Somebody wrote something or did something, there's an author of anything that you're doing. So you should acknowledge who that is. You can use a very formal 
parenthetical at Usher 2020 um, in, in parentheses, or you can, you can use it as you write. Um, but as long as you are acknowledging other people's ideas, um, you should use that kind of citation. So with that, I've told you a little bit about me. I'm a, I'm a, um, a faculty member in anthropology. I teach um, this coming semester, I'll be teaching my food and human evolution course. I often teach a class um, called Humans, Disease and Death, which is really about the evolution of human disease over the course of our evolution. Um, and so I am excited to be able to learn alongside of you as we meet the other interesting faculty. There are also four teaching assistants for the class and I want them each to introduce themselves to you. They're gonna be the ones holding office hours and helping with the grading. So Krista, can you um, introduce yourself? Hi everybody, I'm Krista Shires. I'm one of your TAs. I work with Bethany in the Office of Undergraduate Education. I'm a curriculum specialist and I help faculty get their courses approved through the regular curriculum and work a lot with the Mason Core, which is the general education program. So you'll probably run into me again there. I'm also a PhD student in environmental science and policy. And I'm interested in this class because my master's was uh, focused on the spread of disease through illegal wildlife trade. So I'm really excited to be here. Terrific. Chantel, will you introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Chantel Adu. I am an incoming master's student in the, um, goodness gracious, I blinked. The Higher Education and Student Development with a concentration in student affairs track. Um, I am interested in this class because all throughout my undergrad, I worked with students, um, kind of like coaching them through academics and things like that. So I'm really interested to see how coronavirus and different diseases have affected education as well as like the economic background of it. So yeah. Ter terrific, thank you. Um, Kara, do you wanna introduce yourself? I'm starting my video. Hi, I'm Kara. Um, I completed my undergrad here at Mason in Global and Community Health, and I'm currently pursuing my Master's of Public Health. Um, this past academic year, I was a TA for the undergraduate epidemiology course, and I am ex excited to learn about COVID with you all this summer, because in August, I will start a position with the Virginia Department of Health as a COVID contact tracer. Terrific, thank you. And Nuria, do you want to introduce yourself? Can you guys see me? We can. You are yeah. there. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Noria Paracha. I also did my undergrad at George Mason in Community Health, and I'm in the NPH program, and I'm specifically doing health policy like Kara. Um, I haven't had any TA experience um, somewhat, but I have done current COVID relief for a charity that I volunteer for, um, and I've, we've just been focusing on that and how it's been affecting um, specifically like Muslim communities. So I'm really excited for this course. I love the perspective y'all are all bringing to this. So thank you all. So students, these are the TAs that you'll be working with. They've got office hours that are posted on Blackboard and they're also the ones who are the first line answering the Impact GM email address. Um, so you'll be hearing from them along the way. Um, I've looked at a couple of, um, I, I, a couple of questions that are coming through. The videos we posted to YouTube in the evenings, um, the question is, can you look at the videos rather than being live? We really want you to participate in the question and answer session. If you have the, if you have the opportunity to be able to be live with us, that's the expectation. Um, and we can see the list of people who are involved in the course at the time. Um, but if you have a conflict every once in a while, then being able to watch the videos. Um, we, today we're testing to make sure that we can get them up, how quickly we can get them up after the, after the session is over. But if you need to, that's always a backup plan for you. Um, I've seen a couple things about the style of citations. Um, overall, uh, the APA format, which many of y'all have learned in high school or here at Mason, um, is a good generic style for citations, but we're not going to be grading so much on, the, on whether or not you've got a comment in the right place and much more about can we tell where you've got your ideas and are you correctly, ref correctly referencing your ideas versus somebody else's ideas. So, um, so it, that's, I think, the best answer I can get for that. All right, 
So thank you all. So with that, I am thrilled to be able to introduce our first speaker today. Um, Dr. Amira Roes is a um, professor of global health and epidemiology, um, has a background at the CDC, and is really, if, if, if you've seen um, TV recently, she, she has been on TV several times when I've been like, wait, I know her. Um, and so she's going to be really laying the groundwork for us today to be able to talk about sort of where we are with COVID. And if you saw the readings, some of the, the public, especially the public perception about what people know and don't know about this and sort of where we are and why the US is in such a different place than a lot of other countries that have been much better at controlling it um, is going to be a really interesting conversation. So with that, Amir, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Bethany, for arranging this great class. Um, it's nice to uh, virtually meet you all. Congratulations on starting your first college class for many of you. And um, I'm hoping that today we really can uh, give you all a good overview of what emerging zoonotic diseases are. And maybe leaving this, you'll have a lot more questions um, than answers, and that will propel you to dig a little deeper and uh, do some extra reading on this topic. And the more creative minds we have trying to tackle this problem, the better off we're all going to be. So with that, I'm going to share my screen. And So um, I'm going to just introduce myself briefly and then go into the history of emerging zoonotic diseases, what they are. Then I'll talk about the One Health or multidisciplinary approach that some of you will hear more and more about as you embark on your um, education in coronaviruses and other public health threats. Then we'll talk about international health regulations and what we've been doing for over 150 years as a global society to try to address these sorts of pandemics. And we'll talk about some of the gaps that we're experiencing now and ways forward. So I'm an infectious diseases epidemiologist. And at this point, I think a lot of people know what an epidemiologist is. We are primarily interested in patterns of phenomenon related to health. For me, that means really infectious diseases. And I uh, did a PhD at Johns Hopkins, and then I worked at Hopkins on a policy commission where we tried to really infuse science and evidence into discussions around food animal production. And food animal production basically means how we produce meat, um, chicken, poultry, um, eggs, milk, and, and things like that. Uh, and then from there, I uh, served as an epidemic intelligence service officer at the CDC, which means I worked on outbreaks and was um, at the CDC when we dealt with H1N1, or what was sometimes referred to as the swine flu. And that was a, a pretty serious pandemic um, that many people have forgotten about because um, a lot has happened since it emerged in 2009. And then I went to George Washington University and kept on doing work on emerging zoonotic diseases, including MERS coronavirus, and was able to uh, do some interdisciplinary work in MERS coronaviruses. And then when this occurred, this COVID-19 pandemic emerged, I um, started to include SARS-CoV-2 work in my coronavirus research. So emerging infectious diseases. We know that there are over 1,400 species that cause disease in humans, and they range from viruses like the coronavirus to prions that cause what some of you may have heard of as mad cow disease, and then some of the other um, known regions, prions, bacteria, et cetera. 61% of these 1,400 were zoonotic in origin, meaning they initially spilled over from some sort of an animal host into humans, and now they commonly infect us. Um, Foodborne illnesses are a big part of this. So many of you know about salmonella and E. coli. Um, of the 175 most recently emerged infectious diseases, 75% of them spilled over from uh, animal populations. 
And the coronavirus that we're dealing with right now, SARS-CoV-2, is one of these emerging zoonoses. There are several risk factors or drivers for emerging zoonotic diseases. And this coronavirus pandemic really highlights how land use and interactions with wildlife for medicine, for food, sport, um, for pet trade can really improve or increase rather our chances of being exposed to new diseases. As this disease has also highlighted, global transportation, which increases the speed with which we travel from one part of the world to another, that also increases how quickly pathogens are spread throughout the world. And not just pathogens that we carry, but also it in increases the movement of animals and things like mosquitoes. So this is just a nice graphic that highlights what's been happening over the last 150 plus years. Basically, when we started off here, it took nearly a year to travel around the world, 350 days. And of course, as you now all know, it just takes half a day to go from one side of the world to another. Um, and during this time, we also saw a tremendous increase in the world's population from less than half a billion in 1850 to over 7 billion today. Now this is, you know, sort of a, a nice snapshot of how much we move. Here you could see that at one point we had over 50 million international passenger arrivals and wild mammals were also imported at very high levels, 88,000. The number of travelers that visited abroad for over one night was 63 million. And of course, right now, all of that is sort of on pause or has significantly um, decreased. And then we also have to think about immigrant and refugees being moved around from place to place and how a lot of times when um, individuals are internally displaced in a country, um, sometimes they, you do see exposures to infectious diseases and you see extreme stress that makes people even more vulnerable to getting sick. This is a nice overview of what we call One Health or the interaction between these three very important groups, humans here, wildlife here, and domesticated animals here, and their um, overlap in the emerging infectious disease so you can see that with wildlife, we think a lot about how wildlife are being moved from one place to another. And oftentimes it's because human development or encroachment is causing animals to be displaced. And what, that, what ends up happening is that wildlife may mix with domesticated animals and with humans. And that gives you opportunities for spillover for pathogens or microbes that wildlife are carrying to infect domesticated animals and vice versa. Pathogens or microbes that domesticated animals are carrying could also go back into wildlife species and really devastate some of the wildlife species. And the same thing with humans. Um, with domesticated animals, we, because of the growing demand for meat products and animal products, we've really seen an intensification of agriculture and growing large numbers of animals in small spaces. And this has tremendous implications for the evolution of viruses and other pathogens. So for example, when we deal with um, bird flu or avian influenzas, oftentimes we do think through what happens when a virus enters a poultry house, when there's hundreds of thousands of birds or hosts that the virus can then move through quickly and every time a virus moves from one animal to another and one species from to another species, it changes a little bit. And we think of that as mutation. And that has real implications for spillover events. You know, the right change in a virus can mean all, all the difference in terms of how quickly it will move from one animal to another, how lethal it could be, or how mild it might be. And then we have technology and industry. Which can, also, um, which can also lead to pressures on emerging infectious diseases. 
And then finally, like we mentioned earlier, there's the global travel and the urbanization um, that further ends up Im impacting the emergence of diseases. So One Health is this is a, if you look at the last bullet, it's a collaborative and multidisciplinary approach to address this whole issue of emerging infectious diseases. And again, remember 75% of emerging infectious diseases in the last 30 years were from or, um, animal origins. And so this type of approach really tries to bring together the animal scientists, the agricultural specialists, the anthropologists, and the public health and, uh, folks and all the others to really work together and to try to come up with solutions to address emerging diseases and also new methods to help us try to predict emerging diseases. Um, because, you know, if we can figure out what is it that's going to make the next SARS-CoV-2 emerge, then maybe we can prevent it. If we can figure out how do we detect it early, again, we can maybe put in place certain interventions that can prevent it from spilling over into large numbers of humans and then circulate, circling the globe the way SARS-CoV-2 did. Um, there's lots of other things that we're trying to do um, in a multidisciplinary approach. So this is sort of, um, whenever we teach public health, it's sort of the epidemiology 101 slide, right? So here you have the number of days, right? Day one from when an emerging disease occurs or spills over from an animal to a human, right? Something happened maybe November or December of 2019 and we had SARS-CoV-2 infect a person. Maybe it was before November 2019. And the hope is that we can have some kind of early reporting system in place so we can detect it really close to when this spillover event, this initial spillover event happened. And if we can do this, then we can quickly respond and we can keep the curve from really going high and then boom, it goes down and we have prevented a massive outbreak. But what happens in practice is we still can't really detect anything here. We typically will start to detect infectious diseases, especially new emerging diseases, at some point a month or two after the initial spillover or the initial case happened. And by then, we're already heading up this steep curve of number of cases. And so then a lot of times our response ends up being somewhere around here when it's likely that the peak is already coming down. Um, with SARS-CoV-2, we've really seen how this played out. So, you know, the first case or the the first recognition of this new emerging disease to the global community was really about a month after the initial known case um, was reported to the Chinese government. And, you know, by then, the, we're learning now, the virus had spread to many parts of the world. And we were already heading up this very rapid um, steep hill. So the whole point of a lot of what we do and a lot of the work that scientists and interdisciplinarians are doing right now is to really try to come up with ways to have us work right here in the very beginning. One thing I will also note to all of you, and you're going to hear about this um, in the next couple of weeks from other speakers, um, we have lots of problems with mathematical models and lots of policy makers are really trying to lean heavily on predictive models. And a lot has been invested in coming up with models that will tell us, well, how many cases will occur in a month, in two months, in a week, in two weeks, right? Um, and we're doing so much better than we once were. The models are getting better. However, you know, there's like a joke about how um, models 
are really bad at predicting things, especially things in the future, right? And there's some truth to it. And so um, what will be very important as you move forward in your careers and in your consumption of science and coronavirus literature is that you keep that in mind, right? We're still really in the early stages of the field of, of really trying to come up with very highly predictive models. And the best that we tend to do is to predict two weeks out, right? Um, but you'll learn a lot more about this. And some of you may be really interested in making your whole um, studies and careers around uh, models and statistics around how to make better predictions. So um, I thought this was a very good um, quote here. And part of what happened uh, during the Obama era was that there was a real emphasis in trying to support the global health security agenda and trying to really build bridges between countries and with the World Health Organization to allow us um, to communicate better and to alert each other about emerging diseases. And it was during 2009 um, that we had H1N1 emerge and that was a real pandemic and public health crisis that, this administ that that administration had to face. And so he said, an outbreak in Indonesia can reach Indiana within days and public health crises abroad can cause widespread suffering, conflict, and, uh, and economic contraction. And we've seen all of this play out really uh, in 2020. And we've also seen this play out in many, many um, historical examples. So let's talk a little bit about the present day international health regulations. Um, I wanted you just to see what it looked like in the earlier iterations of this when you know, prior to the international health regulations, it was called the international sanitary regulations. And you can see here what the reports looked like. They really focused in on things like cholera because cholera was absolutely devastating once it um, hit a region. Now, in 1951, the international sanitary regulations really focused on cholera, as I mentioned, and plague and yellow fever. And the communication was largely by fax reports to the World Health Organization. And the goal was always to notify, for a country to notify WHO within 24 hours of realizing that they had cholera, plague, or yellow fever um, within their uh, borders. There was really no mechanism for coordinating any kind of international response uh, to contain the disease during this iteration of the IHRs. Um, WHO could not initiate an inquiry. They really had to depend on the countries to notify them. And the national capacity was really limited to providing support for disease inspection and control at ports of entry to and from um, the infected countries. So in 2007, when we had the revised international health regulations come on board, things changed and we really started to think about not a specific disease, but instead broadly public health emergencies of international concern. And those could be disease like infectious diseases, SARS-CoV-2 is one of them, or um, you know, something of a bioterrorism uh, concern. And every country that signed on was to appoint a national, international, um, their own international health regulation focal point. Someone who sat in the central government who would then report directly to the World Health Organization. And the goal was that, again, you would still want people to report to the WHO within 24 hours of realizing there was um, a public health emergency in their countries. And then we wanted to have no more than 70, 72 hours to respond, um, for the countries to respond to WHO with additional information as the WHO asked, uh, for, asked for it. The response was really specific that if there is a public health emergency that there could be assistance to help the country respond and there'd also be recommended measures that could be put forth. 
And this was another big difference that the WHO could then initiate requests for information if they heard rumors about an emerging infectious disease and the WHO can move forward and ask for additional information and not really have to wait and depend on the country to report. And as we've learned with SARS-CoV-2, it didn't really 100% go as planned, but it was better than what we saw with SARS, the first SARS that emerged around 2002-4. And there's a lot more um, work detailed in the IHR surrounding what can be done um, to follow up whenever there's a, an emergency reported. So I just wanted you to have this so that you can look it up if you wanted to learn more about this. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that at some point, 196 countries had signed on to the international health regulations, including all of the WHO member states. Given the recent rise in nationalism throughout the world and some countries trying to pull themselves out of the World Health Organization, it remains to be seen what impact that's going to have on the international health regulations that took really um, more than five decades and longer to, uh, to put together. Hmm. So I've already mentioned some of this. Um, one thing I'll also highlight is that at some point, um, it was legally binding for WHO member states since the recent iteration was um, put forth in 2007. And as I mentioned, as countries um, are pulling themselves out of WHO or becoming more nationalistic, it's um, troubling to see what that might mean for this. The purpose of the international health regulations are to do all those things that would help us have a unified global response to pandemics. And those are to prevent, protect against, control, and provide a public health response to the international spread of disease in ways um, that are commiserate with and restricted to public health risks and which avoid unnecessary interference with international traffic and trade. And this is where you do have sometimes two main activities that are at odds with each other because sometimes to do the public health response, you do have to do things like limit movement, limit traffic and limit trade. And as we've seen with this SARS-CoV-2, that when those two things are at odds with each other, the response oftentimes gets further hampered and you end up actually seeing a protracted pandemic like we're seeing now. I had mentioned that the scope of events um, in the IHR had emerged from three um, or more specific infectious diseases, plague, yellow fever, cholera, to deliberate accidental or natural events. And they're all under the term public health emergency of international concern. <clears throat> the IHRs, they highlight core capacity requirements and every country that has a functioning health system has parts of this already embedded in their health system. And so in the US, we have the legislation and policies around coordination and surveillance. Um, we have the response and preparedness systems that sit at both federal, state, and local levels. Um, we have the laboratory systems, and we have networks of laboratories that link back up from the local level to the state to the national level. What happens in practice when a disease emerges, um, or what's supposed to happen is that at the local level, something happens that's unexpected. This new disease emerges. And the local health department in the US, it could be the county or the state health department, they should have the resources in place, the laboratory systems, they should have the healthcare providers um, who would then realize that this is something new and they would quickly report to the next level. So the county would report to the state. And while that reporting is happening here from the county to the state, this, the county would also implement control measures. And those control measures are things that you all have heard about now, right? They would be asking the infected individual to quarantine or to isolate. Um, they would be initiating contact tracing and identifying all known contacts and asking them to self 
quarantine. Um, all of that should be happening in tandem with the report going to the state. And the state's job in the US is to confirm that this is a new disease, to assess the situation, to report back up to the national level, and also to assist with the response at the local level. The national uh, reporting, so we would go from a county health department, let's say, to a state, and then to the national, to the CDC. At the CDC, they would also uh, verify, um, they would provide support and assistance to both the state and the local level with the response. Um, they maybe would provide some sort of laboratory capacity as needed. And then the person at the national level who is supposed to be linked to the global community. So remember at this level, there should be an international health regulation focal point for every country. So ours would then report to the WHO as soon as they would verify that this is a new event. And ideally, ideally all of this would happen very quickly, right? We want, as soon as they find out about it, we want them to notify the WHO through the IHRs within 24 hours, right? And we know that it does take longer than 24 hours for all of these different activities to occur. But this is how it would operate in um, an ideal situation. And this is just another um, illustration for how the flow of information could go. And so one thing to keep in mind when you're trying to understand what goes on in the US side is what are the relationships between the county health departments, the state health department, and the federal or the CDC level. And there's a lot that goes on here. You know, the US is unique in, in a lot of ways um, from a lot of countries that I've worked in because here in the US, oftentimes our states function to some extent as um, a mini government, right? In terms of uh, having, you know, their their own rules or their own uh, guidelines um, to some extent. And ideally, this local to state to CDC communication should be smooth and timely. Um, but we, what we often find is that at the local uh, county health department level, um, we don't have as many resources to keep the public health system going as we, as we should have. Um, you know, we always talk in public health about one of the biggest issues with public health being that when it's quiet, funding and support goes away for public health departments and for public health activities and for public works infrastructure. So when it's quiet, that means there is no outbreaks of infectious diseases. There's no infant death due to infectious diseases. There are no mass mortality events or mass hospitalizations due to infectious diseases or contaminated water or things like that. And so it's quiet and everything is fine. And so what the knee jerk reaction of lots of policymakers is, is that, you know what, let's take the funding away from the public health infrastructure or the public works and put it somewhere else. And so when you do that over time, what you end up doing is eroding that public health infrastructure and that support that we so desperately need to keep our country safe and to keep our states um, healthy and able to respond to public health emergencies. And so in uh, the most recent, well, in the 2008 recession, um, a global or the economic crisis then, and, and now we have another economic crisis on our hands, but in 2008, what ended up happening was that lots of health departments saw furloughs. You know, you had um, mandatory one day a week furloughs in lots of county health departments. And, you know, over time, what ended up happening was that um, the public health system lost a lot of people because they needed to find work elsewhere um, that was more stable and that could allow them to support themselves and their families. And so over time, we've really seen a deterioration of our public health infrastructure. And now, you know, COVID-19 has really highlighted how critical it is to have a functioning public health system and how critical it is for preparedness and response. If you don't have a robust local health department, right, you don't have the infrastructure to support any kind of preparedness and response activities. And that's exactly what this pandemic has highlighted for us in the US. 
So one of the TAs mentioned that she's working as a, or she'll be starting um, as a contact tracer for the Virginia Department of Health. And um, Virginia, like many other states, has tried to um, more than quadruple its contact tracing workforce, more than. I mean, um, Virginia had said that they wanted to hire 1,300 contact tracers by the end of the summer. And as of five weeks ago, they had 300 hired. Um, and they've been ramping up, you know, trying to uh, bring on a lot more contact tracers. New York, California, every other jurisdiction in the U.S. is facing something similar with trying to um, address the pretty significant gaps that we have um, in our public health infrastructure. Um, so I'm going to skip over this, but you will have this and you can just see that what I described as being, you know, somewhat linear here is actually a lot more complex. <clears throat> and this highlights just how important it is to have um, a relationship with the international governing bodies. So the WHO, uh, you could see here the number of reports that they've um, had sent to them uh, in terms of acute public health events. So um, a large number here, the purple, uh, my screen is purple, these are infectious diseases. And you also see that there are sometimes um, reports of contaminated food products or other sorts of contaminated pro products here that are reported to WHO. Um, you also have outbreaks of infectious diseases among animals, sometimes food animals or uh, chemical hazards or spills in the environment or chemical contamination of large uh, numbers of animals or people. These also get reported to the WHO. And sometimes this is the only way that countries are going to have um, one salient central place of getting these sorts of reports. Um, and the WHO oftentimes goes and verifies this information and helps countries um, who, that don't have uh, infrastructure to mount appropriate responses. Hmm. And I'll just say a few words because I know time is um, almost up and I want to give you all a chance to uh, ask questions. Um, throughout the world, what COVID-19 has also done is really highlight the extent of the vulnerable populations and how um, the world over, especially in the U.S., we do have some um, pretty significant disparities and we have a long road ahead of us to try to address them. So in the US, we tend to think of vulnerable populations as being primarily populations of color um, that had have been historically disadvantaged, um, meaning that a lot, of, uh, uh, a lot of them were descendants of slaves and um, had grown up at the, you know, just recently during segregation times. I mean, this is not that far away from where we sit uh, presently. And, we have seen that with this historical disadvantage comes structural issues whereby many, um, uh, many populations, many people of color do report having um, some pretty terrible experiences in healthcare facilities with the healthcare system, um, with the educational system, with the judicial system. All of that ties into economic disadvantages, social disadvantages, it's all linked. And we have known for decades that mortality rates are disproportionate when you look at people of color, um, primarily uh, Native American populations. Oftentimes their mortality rates mirror that of what you see in war-torn areas and in low-income populations. Um, African American populations, they have disproportionate mortality rates compared to um, white populations in the US. We have known this for decades. There's paper after paper, analysis after analysis about this, and COVID-19 has highlighted it. And we have seen in Virginia, for example, in Fairfax, you know, in the county where George Mason's headquarters is, something like 15% of the population is Hispanic, yet 50% of the COVID cases are among Hispanics. And, you know, this highlights some of the real problems with our system and this institutional or systemic um, racism and disadvantage that happens. In DC, 
where you have 45% of your population being African-American, you have more than 80% of your COVID cases being African-American. And again, it highlights the disparities that we're seeing. And oftentimes it goes back to the economic disparities and the healthcare inequality and the healthcare experiences that people of color um, often get. Um, I will also highlight that if you look uh, across the world, you can see here how we compare to a lot of other countries when, um, when we're looking at our healthcare infrastructure and, our, and the population centers. So these, um, these circles are megacities um, throughout the world. And red means that a country does not have adequate healthcare infrastructure, right? And so red is really poor, orange is poor, yellow is fair, blue is good, and then green is excellent. So green is Canada, parts of Western Europe, Australia, New Zealand, and the US didn't have data to contribute to this um, analysis. And that's you know, somewhat troubling. And now you can see in the recent analyses um, that, that does include every country of the world that, the, that uh, the US does great in some respects, but really poorly in others. And um, this further highlights some of the global issues that we have to contend with in our country. And so um, with that, I'm going to stop in order to make sure that we have some time um, for questions. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Ruiz. I've been watching the questions for in students. Um, what we want you to do is use, if you look at the bottom of the screen, you'll see you've got a Q&A. We want you to use that and not the chat. It's over on your, for me, it's on my far right, um, to be able to keep track of the, of the questions that are coming up. And in that Q&A, you can also vote up and down questions. So they're ones that I can see and bring um, to Dr. Ruiz um, earlier than other ones. Um, so Dr. Ross, do you want to turn your um, camera back on so that we can see and talk? Sure. And my cat decided to join in the conversation. Um, so, um, so one of the first questions I've seen is there have been a couple questions about what are contact tracers and how will they, how do they help stop um, a pandemic? Can you describe mm -hmm. that? Yeah, sure. So when someone is infectious, right? They're going to spread the disease to a few individuals, right? As soon as we realize someone is in fact infectious, what we want to do is ask them to self-isolate or quarantine. And then we want to find out who have they been around. Um, and then we want to go to those folks that they've been around. And the contractor, contact tracer's job is to find out who they've been around. And then they would get in touch with them, they'd explain that they've been exposed and they'd ask them to please self-quarantine. And once you do that, what you're basically doing is you're keeping anyone who might possibly become infectious, who might possibly develop symptoms, you're keeping them out of the population so that you can break the cycle of infection. And so the contact tracer's job is really important to identify possibly expose individuals early on and keep them away from everybody else and to really support them to stay put and to monitor themselves for symptoms. And so with the case of COVID-19, we know that this is a very transmissible disease and we need as many contact tracers as we can to identify the, con the contacts and to work on following up with them, making sure that they stay home or quarantine somehow and to monitor them in case they do develop symptoms. And can you talk a little bit about the value of having um, culturally appropriate contact tracers? Right, so the best practice is to have contact tracers who are familiar with the local situation and are familiar with the local culture and the stressors that, may, um, that many people may be facing. So, um, and the reason you want that is you, the contract tracer needs to be able to speak with the individuals there um, they're in touch with to, you know, really build a good rapport and to get a full understanding of their level of exposure, um, if they are willing to quarantine, and if not, what could possibly be done to support them in quarantining, um, or, you know, to provide them with 
um, masks and gloves and extra tools to really support them to minimize the risk of spreading the infection to other individuals. And so um, it becomes very important that the right person is hired to do the contact tracing. Terrific. And a kind of related question to that, several students have voted up a question that I think is on a lot of people's minds. Um, is, is When we look at the populations here in Fairfax County, the fact that the Latinx population makes up more than 50% of the cases, even though they're a much smaller portion of the population, a student is asking, are people of color more likely to get the virus because of the conditions or the social conditions or because of a biological reason? So we're trying to understand this more, but it does seem as though it's really the social conditions that are driving this. For example, a lot of um, Latinos in Fairfax reported that they had to go to work. You know, they just couldn't afford to not go to work. And um, part of what ends up happening when you're out, um, especially among, you know, populations that are in the service sector or um, in hourly positions is that they're exposed to lots of people. At one point during this pandemic, we did see that a lot of grocery store workers were coming back positive because you know, they were out working, they were exposed to a lot of people and not everyone was wearing a mask or trying to be you know, extra careful, especially early on in the pandemic. And so early on, you started to see a disproportionate effect on, on uh, populations of color. Excellent, yes. Um, a lot of people are asking about the about the um, the U.S. relationship with the WHO, and what do you think the impact is going to be that we're that, that the current president is distancing us from being a part of the WHO? You know, um, I asked a few friends who work in policy about um, how likely is it that um, we won't be able to restore our relationship with the WHO. You know, assuming that. One day we'll we'll uh, we'll have um, national support for that kind of relationship, and you know they they gave me some hope. They said it's very difficult to just um, destroy these relationships and agreements. Um, if we do fully sever our ties with the WHO, and then like you saw in the presentation, there's a lot of um, there's going to be a lot of problems with reporting and the flow of information. Um, the WHO uh, does serve a really important function uh, to link all countries together under a common goal, which is to really reduce the impact of public health emergencies and to allow us to collaborate and to coordinate. It takes decades to, to really build these collaborations and this culture of reporting. Um, and so it is problematic um, that we may find ourselves pulling out of that. It's also problematic that we're now living through this sort of age of nationalism. Um, you know, many countries are, are moving towards this uh, constant nationalistic rhetoric. Um, and it may be kind of in direct uh, contrast to the, the, the tone of globalization that was really, uh, you know, praised around the world. So this just could be the pendulum swing. Um, but you know, I, I often highlight to a lot of um, a lot of my colleagues uh, from other disciplines that um, we really rely on communication between countries to identify public health emergencies, to identify contaminated foods or contaminated products, so that we can better protect our citizens. You know, this is a global market, a global society, a global economy. Um, the products that are made in China or in Brazil. You know, they make their way here. And the only way that we communicate over their safety in some ways is through, um, you know, global governing bodies like the WHO, like the UN. Um, and so it's really, uh, it's, it's really going to be difficult to rebuild um, that collaboration and trust if we fully remove ourselves. So following up on that, I keep hearing people say, um, that this is a once in a lifetime kind of thing. Is this really a once in a lifetime or is this the only zoonotic emerging infectious disease we're likely to face? And if we're done with this one, are we really done? So we have, we have this SARS-CoV-2 COVID-19 in 2020. Mm -hmm. um, Ebola was in you know, 2015. We really saw um, sort of the tapering off of it then. Um, MERS coronavirus has been around 
for since 2012. It's another coronavirus. It's had quite a few um, uh, outbreaks, primarily in hospitals in many different countries. We've had a couple of cases in the US, but we were very lucky. Same thing with Ebola. You know, we were lucky in a lot of ways. Um, SARS-1 was in 2002, and that was very similar to this SARS in many ways. Um, and we've, you know, we had many, many um, influenza pandemics. Mm -hmm. uh, the one in 2009 that I mentioned, H1N1, um, H5N1, or avian flu or bird flu, um, that was a really big problem in 2005. Um, there were just quite a few, and many of you have heard of the 1918 pandemic, the, the, the great influenza, right? So I think what, we're, what we've seen is that in the last 20 years, there's been an acceleration of these pandemic events, um, but we've been lucky because for, for a whole bunch of different reasons, the virus's properties, the way we were moving, where the virus emerged, it wasn't as bad as what COVID-19 was. We just were lucky. We were lucky in the States, but other countries, they really had to deal with Ebola's devastating effects. They had to deal with H1N1's um, early devastating effects, um, or SARS-1, SARS you know, China, um, Hong Kong, Canada. There were lots of countries that really suffered. mers cov 2 you had a large outbreak in South Korea. Many of the Arabian Gulf countries faced it. Um, so, so what I see is an acceleration between um, the time of one pandemic to another and I think we're moving into this new age of pandemics. I, I don't think this is really a, a, a once in a lifetime or a hundred year event anymore. Right. And, I, and I've seen a couple students mention that there was an article out over the weekend that was talking about, uh, about um, swine flu or versions of H1N1 that they're finding in swine in, in Asia right now that, um, that has raised some alarms. So I think you, right, we are in a, a period of time where we need to learn to respond to these. So switching, um, switching direction a little bit, um, a really popular question that's coming up is about wearing masks. Masks have become one of the features of this pandemic. It says, why did the CDC only recommend wearing match masks until fairly late? And has not wearing masks contribute to the rise in the number of cases? So it's important to realize that we've never been a culture of mask wearers um, in parts of Asia, you know, Japan, South Korea, you see a lot more people wearing masks during flu season. Um, there's this understanding, oh, if I don't feel well, you know, part of the social contract is I'm going to wear a mask um, to keep myself from infecting other people. So we just didn't have that culture. And um, it's, I, you know, our culture makes it a bit uh, challenging for some of these recommendations to really be palatable to you know, require or to strongly recommend or mandate that people wear masks. It, it's, a, it's a bit of a lift to have a large proportion of our population um, accept these kinds of messages and take it on. And then I think there was also some um, disagreement about who should be wearing a mask, how long they should be wearing a mask. And it's important to remember uh, COVID-19, still a pretty new virus. There's still a lot that we don't know. And when the recommendation came out in early April, you know, there was still a lot that we didn't know about the virus and um, it you know, wasn't 100% clear um, what, what the exact um, protection the masks afforded. Um, so, so, you know, those are probably some of the reasons why we saw um, a, a slow um, response or coming to terms with this idea of wearing masks. You know, the other thing I'm gonna highlight is we have so much um, coming out in, in terms of scientific knowledge about um, SARS-CoV-2. What you tend to see is that a lot of the science is somewhat being reported in the media, not through peer-reviewed um, journals. Uh, you see a lot of these uh, um, open access, uh, pre-peer-review uh, pre publications. And on the one hand, you know, maybe that's good because more information is getting out there, but it's really problematic because we've had some very serious problems with falsified data or, um, you know, data retraction coming out that has honestly hindered the response. You saw that with some of the clinical trials um, of some of the therapeutics and 
in you know well-known journals like the New England Journal or the Lancet, and and um, this is really problematic, and it's also uh, causing more confusion um, than is helpful at this stage. And so um, this is another issue that a lot of us are grappling with. How do we get you know good science produced and out there when everybody's really just trying to um, you know do mass data dumps essentially? And it's interesting, you're touching on several things that we're going to be talking, like many of the things, this is the reason why you're going first, is because you're touching on many of the things that we're going to be talking about. So Tyler Cohen in economics is actually talking about the speed premium and what, what are the drawbacks, you know, what are the pressures and the drawbacks of moving faster um, from everything from drug delivery to article production to, um, to things like production of, of PPE in his talk a little bit later on. Um, and we also have one of the faculty members who's been working on, on those models of, of spread, um, who's going to be talking later during this series, because those are all connected. Um, a couple more questions. Um, here's, here's an interesting one from a zoonotic standpoint. How can animals be symptomatic of coronavirus? And do they have the same kind of symptoms that we do? So what you tend to see with... Um zoonotic diseases is oftentimes um, the species that's the reservoir or that's carrying a lot of the virus around doesn't get sick at all. It doesn't show any symptoms. Um, not 100%, but that's often what you see. And so they're a perfect reservoir. They could spread the virus. They're fine. Um, other species can't detect that anything is wrong with them. They'll eat the animal. They'll get exposed. They'll get sick. Um, so oftentimes you do find that the reservoir host, the reservoir animal species doesn't have symptoms. But like in the case of Ebola, what we do know is that mammals that are more similar to us, like non-human primates, mm -hmm. um, they do tend to have um, symptoms when they're exposed to Ebola. And one of my colleagues, she worked on some of the earlier known Ebola outbreaks um, in uh, some in a, in a remote part of Gabon, and she was saying that um, the populations that she worked with, they knew as soon as they saw non-human primates, um, you know, exhibiting signs of bleeding and other things, they knew what it was coming and they would, um, you know, evacuate, right? It was something right. that had been passed down. So, so that's one case of where, where if the species is more similar to us, you'll see symptoms, but other species, um, you know, aren't as affected. Uh, so every virus is a little bit different. Um, I'll also point out that coronaviruses have a very wide um, range, right? There's so many species um, uh, and strains of coronaviruses, and some of them affect um, swine, some affect mice, some affect, you know, dogs. Um, so, you know, and those animals will get really sick, and we won't if we're exposed to that same virus. So um, it it is uh, a lot, it's very nuanced, and there's still a lot that we don't know about coronaviruses because they've been so understudied. Right. <laughs> and I bet that's going to be changing, um, but they do have that long co-evolutionary history with different mammalian species. I know that. Um, so here's a really good question, um, especially going back to some of the materials in the, in the surveys that you've been working on in particular. Um, and, and so I, I, I really, I think this is really interesting. It, and this, a student is asking, out of all the misconceptions non-experts have about the virus, what do you think is most impactful? What do you think is, is hindering us the most? So, you know, there's this, um there's this uh, message out there that it won't make you that sick. It's not a big deal. It's like a minor flu. Mm -hmm. And okay, for some populations, like very, you know, like young, young people who are very healthy, all right, maybe the majority of them won't get, um, won't end up hospitalized, but there's still a proportion of them that do end up hospitalized. And there's still a lot that we don't understand about this virus. Mm -hmm. And Right now, we're seeing a lot of young adults are um, getting infected, and then they're spreading it to vulnerable populations. And this is really problematic. So, you know, um, it's not just that I'm young and very healthy, I'm, I'm going to be fine. It's just a minor flu. You know, you don't, you can't guarantee that because we've seen young, very healthy athletes who ended up very sick and in the hospital on ventilators. Mm -hmm. We still can't predict who is 
going to be, uh, you know, like 99% fine and not, not very sick from this. So, um, you know, I, I think this is a problem with a virus that's so new. Um, we're, we're really, we want to have a nice line. We want to absorb this, this, this easy message that we're going to be fine. The majority of us are going to be fine. The other thing that I'll highlight is never before have we had so many people who are actually vulnerable, who have hypertension, who have some kind of cardiovascular disease, who have asthma, some sort of respiratory condition, who are on anti-immunosuppressives, um, um, who are on cancer drugs. We have never had such a large proportion of our population who is actually vulnerable to a coronavirus or to you know, any of these emerging diseases. And that completely should change how we're thinking about these. Um, and then, you know, again, it's a new virus. We don't know if you're gonna be sicker upon reinfection, um, if there, what the proportion of reinfection is. Um, we don't know how long immunity lasts. There's so much that we don't know that, mm -hmm. you know, going out and uh, not wearing masks, um, it's troubling. Right. I, I totally agree. And when we think about what we're doing with campus return, some of the students are asking this question. I don't think we're kind of there yet. Um, but one of the points of this class is to start here with this conversation. And the last day of this class will actually be Lisa Park and Julie Zobel. Lisa Park is our campus physician and Julie Zobel is our emergency um, preparedness expert. Um, we actually don't know all the answers to these things about how we're even going to handle it on campus. Other, and, and, and how several of the students are asking questions about sort of how do we enforce guidelines like this. Um, but our goal in part of this class is to be able to have that conversation. Um, so I think that's going to be our last question um, it, for you. I think that it sets us up well for the rest of the, of the semester or the rest of the not a semester, the next of the month where we're going to be having this conversation. And a lot of the questions are edging into sort of the political about the fact that there are clear political lines um, that are making a difference, also seen in some of the readings that you've got. And that'll lead in, so Dr. Victor, who'll be talking tomorrow, um, will take from where you are and move us into the next thing. So um, yeah, she's, she's super excited about it. So um, Dr. Rose, do you have any last thing to say? And Jennifer, do you want to do one prompt before we go? So I'll start with Dr. Rose. Um, I just want to thank you again for bringing this class together. I'm happy to do, uh, you know, follow up uh, Q and A's. If you, you know, have some pressing questions, I'm happy to try to answer those by email. Um, thank you again, Bethany, for bringing us all together and uh, good luck, everyone. This is, um, Hopefully, it'll be a once-in-a-lifetime <laughs> event right. in our lifetime, but, um, you know, good luck moving forward. Terrific, and thank you so much for being here. It is such a pleasure to have such an expert to be able to help kick us off and be able to help put this in this larger perspective for us. I'm so pleased you took the time. And Dr. Victor, do you want to say anything to, to sort of plug everybody for tomorrow? Um, well, you know, I've been telling a lot of people that the theme of, of 2020 is uncertainty. Um, but uh, I think uh, Amira set the stage really nicely for a great transition into the topics that I'll address tomorrow and looking at the politics of, of COVID-19. And even though the theme of 2020 is, is uncertainty, I mean, Bethany, you're just, everything that Bethany touches kind of turns to gold. And she's organized this so beautifully um, that these, these transitions are just going to be great. So I'm, I'm happy to, to do my part and, and slot in here. And I'm, I'm really excited to uh, interact with these students who are all bringing really great questions. They really are. So we're going to keep track of these questions. And we'll, students, if your question hasn't been answered yet, we'll try and answer them, send them on to be able to get an answer. And we will, um, and we will also um, be asking you, some of these questions are relevant in multiple days. So keep asking questions. As you're doing the readings, keep a list. And, and today we've figured out, a lot of you are figuring out how to get on and, um, and get connected and how to start doing your first prompt. Remember, if you did already start a prompt, make sure to go back and edit it to be able to bring anything you've got um, from today's presentation. Um, I think we've answered almost all of your questions about the context of the class. I'm hoping we have a lot of that out of the way so that we can concentrate on the content um, for the rest of the summer because we are really lucky to have such fabulous faculty working with us. So with that, I'm going to close out the class today. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for being willing to engage in the middle of your summer and be able to think hard about all of these really important issues. And we will see you all tomorrow. Thank you so much.